It's the Adam Ragusea Podcast, I Do Declare, As I Live and Breathe. It's episode 47. Today, we are going to go deep on sugar. What exactly is sugar, apart from delicious? Sucrose versus fructose versus glucose, etc. What do they taste like? What do they do to food? What do they do to your body? All of that. Sugar has been in the news lately. A huge observational study out of the UK just came out indicating that added sugars in food increase your risk of cardiovascular disease, while an equivalent amount of natural sugars do not. What's the difference? What even is an added sugar versus a natural sugar? What even is sugar? Like so many terms from chemistry, the definition is actually a little fuzzy. There are molecules that everyone agrees are sugars, just like there are molecules that everyone agrees are acids, but there are like three competing definitions of what exactly an acid is. You got your Lewis acids, your Bronsted Lowry acids, and the third one that I can never remember and I refuse to look up right now. Chemical definitions tend to be lists of attributes or properties, and a chemical is found to meet that definition if it ticks the boxes for all, or perhaps even just some, of those properties. And so, people often express those properties as like tendencies. A sugar tends to do this. A sugar tends to have that. But not all of those tendencies are unique to the class of chemicals being thusly described. Sugars tend to bond to the sweetness receptors in your taste buds, thus giving you the sensation of sweetness, But lots of other kinds of chemicals do that as well, like ketones and aldehydes. Everybody agrees that sucrose and fructose and glucose and lactose and galactose and maltose are all sugars. Those are the six most common sugars. But it is debatable how you write a definition that encompasses all of those and excludes all of the other molecules that nobody considers to be sugars. And thus, there are a number of edge cases. Some people call allulose a sugar substitute, while other people call it a rare sugar. You definitely wouldn't call allulose an artificial sweetener because it does occur naturally in fruits, just in very small amounts, hence rare sugar. And there's all kinds of other weirdos that I'd never heard of until I sat down to research sugars for you, like there's a sugar called ribose, which is what puts the R in RNA, and deoxyribose, which puts the D in DNA. Those are both sugars. The structural backbone of your genes consists of a sugar alternating with a phosphate in a big, long chain. I realize nobody actually goes out to meet people in bars anymore. All you kids just swipe one way or another on some creepy app now instead of going to some creepy bar like your like your mother and I did in the old days. But if you're looking for a pickup line to use in the bar, say, hey, your DNA is so sweet. Assuming you don't immediately get a drink thrown in your face, you can explain that what you've said is literally true. The point is, there's lots of sugar apart from the big six sugars that you've heard of. As far as I can tell, everything that people call a sugar consists of the same atomic raw materials. Sugars are all different combinations of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but that also describes all carbohydrates, and not all carbohydrates are sugars. Sugars tend to have between three and seven carbon atoms, between three and seven oxygen atoms as well. Sugars tend to have two hydrogen atoms for every one atom of oxygen and every one atom of carbon. But there are sugars that deviate slightly from that proportion, like this one that I'd never heard of before called fucose which occurs in small amounts on the surface of cells in insects and mammals like us. Fucose has six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms. So that's the the two to one ratio that we expect. But then there's only five 
oxygen atoms, which throws off the two to one to one rule slightly. The 2-1-1 rule similarly does not quite apply to the big disaccharides, the double sugars. That's sucrose, lactose, and maltose. Those are all two monosaccharides bonded together. And when they bond together, they share an oxygen atom in the middle, like conjoined twins might share a torso, an odd number of torsos relative to an even number of heads and therefore an even number of distinct human beings. Sucrose, table sugar, consists of one glucose and one fructose sharing an oxygen atom between them. So one molecule of sucrose consists of 12 carbon atoms total, but just 11 oxygen atoms because they're sharing one. By the way, there are trisaccharides, three sugars bonded together, Raffinose is one that you might have heard of before, super common in seeds and therefore super common in human diets because humans mostly eat seeds. Raffinose is in whole grains and beans and in vegetables, particularly in brassicas. Raffinose is a glucose plus a fructose plus a galactose. It's slightly sweet about 10% as sweet as table sugar, but it's totally indigestible in humans. We do not make the enzyme necessary to break it down, and I reckon that's why people rarely call it a sugar, even though it is a little sweet. It plays the role of fiber in a human diet. So it's not a sugar. Another of these slightly more complex carbohydrates you've almost certainly heard of is maltodextrin, one of the most popular processed food ingredients in the world. Maltodextrin does occur naturally, but not inside foods, as far as I know. It occurs naturally inside our intestines as we break down starches. Processed food companies are obviously not harvesting maltodextrin from our intestines. They make it by hydrolyzing starches to break them down into maltodextrins. Maltodextrins are chains of between three and 17 glucoses all stuck together. Glucoses doesn't sound right as the plural for glucose, but text edit didn't flag it as misspelled. So I'm going with glucoses instead of Glucose I, which doesn't sound right if given scientific Latin pronunciation, glucose I, but if I give it modern Italian pronunciation, glucose C, sounds pretty good. If I ever start an organized crime family, we're going to be the glucose. We will mark our victims with corn syrup. I won't tell you where we will mark them. That's the surprise. Anyway, maltodextrins are chains of between 3 and 17 glucosi, and because they're laid out in chains rather than rings, and because of the particular bonds between the glucose units, maltodextrins are easier for humans to taste and to digest as compared to other oligosaccharides that get categorized as dietary fiber. Oligosaccharides are carbs that are too big to be considered simple sugars, like too many glucose units or whatever, but too small to be considered something more complex like starch. Fibrous oligosaccharides are what make beans the musical fruit because they pass undigested to your large intestine where they are easily metabolized by bacteria into various gaseous chemicals. Maltodextrins are oligosaccharides, but unlike the fibrous ones, you can actually taste maltodextrins as sweet. Depending on how many glucose units it has, the smaller the chain, the more intense the sweet taste. Regardless, your body can break it down into individual glucose C pretty easily, and so maltodextrin spikes your blood sugar just as bad as table sugar does, and potentially even worse because maltodextrin is all glucose all the time, whereas table sugar, sucrose, is half glucose, half 
fructose. And fructose is digested much more slowly than glucose for reasons that we're going to get to. Some people call maltodextrin a sugar. Some people don't. It is used for textural or structural properties in foods. It's a common thickener and a filler. It stabilizes foams. So it goes into beer to give you a a nicer head. One really popular thing it's used for is making the, uh, the flavor powders that they sprinkle onto chips and stuff. Maltodextrin powder can absorb liquid flavor ingredients like vinegar and yet remain a dry powder that you can easily shake onto your deep fried corn paste at the factory, thus making it taste like something other than highly refined deep fried corn paste. And it might taste a little sweet as a bonus because maltodextrins taste at least a little sweet depending on how big they are. But there, we are really on the edge of anybody's definition of sugar. Then again, there are molecules that hew closer to a strict chemical definition of sugar, and yet no one calls them sugar. There are molecules that consist of hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen in a perfect 2-1-1 ratio, and yet no one calls them sugars, most notably in the food world at least, acetic acid, vinegar. Vinegar is a diluted solution of acetic acid, generally 4 to 8% acetic acid. And if you just look at the empirical chemical formula of acetic acid, it sure looks a lot like a sugar. It's four hydrogens, two carbons, two oxygens, 2 one one ratio. Indeed, acetic acid is made when bacteria ferment sugar into alcohol, and then into acetic acid. So it makes sense that all three of those things would consist of the same basic raw materials. Most organic chemistry is hydrogen and oxygen and carbon, but just as we know in the kitchen that you can make many very different things from the same raw materials, you know, slightly different configurations of butter and sugar and flour and eggs get you everything from cakes to cookies and everything in between. Similarly, you can get radically different things by arranging carbon and oxygen and hydrogen in slightly different proportions and slightly different configurations within space and with different types of bonds holding them together. This is why a simple chemical formula cannot adequately define sugar, because such a definition could encompass vinegar, and formaldehyde. And nobody thinks vinegar or formaldehyde are sugars. Formaldehyde isn't even a solid at room temperature. It's a highly toxic gas, though it would smell sweet to you before you died because it's chemically kind of a sugar. We just don't call it that because we don't eat it, I guess. Sugars tend to have this basic chemical formula They also tend to be sweet tasting. They tend to form gritty little crystals when isolated, and those crystals tend to be soluble in water. The English word sugar and the synonymous scientific Latin word saccharide, these have the same likely etymological origins. It's a word brought to Europe by the Arabs which they got from the Persians, which they got from the Indians. It all goes back to a Sanskrit word, sarkara, which originally meant grit, as in a sandy substance, something consisting of little hard particles. India, about 2,000 years ago, is where they first perfected the process of boiling down cane sugar juice to produce a sticky mass of little pebbles. They naturally called the resulting substance grit, sarkara. And thus, the Sanskrit word for grit transformed into a word for concentrated, isolated, sweet chemicals. And that word spread throughout the world as refined sugar spread from India to Persia to Arabia to North Africa and into the Mediterranean world about a thousand years ago is when it got there. That doesn't mean that Europeans lacked sweeteners prior to the importation of cane sugar by Islamic traders. Everybody who lived around bees knew about honey. Also, some ants make honey, 
And uh, indigenous Australians have been eating ant honey for God knows how many thousands of years. But uh, back on the main continental masses of the planet, people have been harvesting honey from beehives since the Neolithic age, at least. The basic honey bees we know today are from Afro-Eurasia, but in pre-Columbian America, they had indigenous stingless bees they domesticated for honey production. The stingless bees don't make nearly as much honey because their colonies tend to be much smaller, but we know the Mayans maintained colonies for honey production. The stingless bee honey tends to have a higher water content, Honey is a syrup, after all. It's glucose and fructose dissolved in a small amount of water. Bees make it by enzymatically treating the nectar they suck up from plants. Your typical honey from a European honey bee might be like 20% water, whereas honey from a stingless bee might be over 30% water, and so it doesn't keep as long. But if you don't need a ton of honey... And if you're cool with eating it promptly, keeping a small colony of stingless American bees is a safe hobby that is apparently enjoyed by lots of people in Brazil, where the climate is just right for this, because you can get a few liters of honey a year from a little hive that you can keep on like a tiny back garden or a balcony or a rooftop. And again, they literally can't sting anyone. Some of them bite, though, apparently. They got strong little mandibles. Sorry, I just gave the uh, international sign for strong little mandibles to those of you who are watching this on home video. If you're listening to the podcast, you'll have to imagine the universal sign for strong little mandibles. Honey generally contains two of the most common monosaccharides, which are glucose and fructose. Glucose and fructose have identical chemical formulas. They are both six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. Those atoms are usually bonded together in the form of a ring, though not always. Fructose and glucose are structural isomers, meaning it's the same atoms, They're just bonded together in a different order or arrangement in space. And even within glucose and fructose, there are subcategories, slightly different arrangements of the atoms, making for two slightly different kinds of glucose. There's D-glucose, also known as dextrose, which is the one that's commonly found in nature. And then there's a synthetic one made in the lab called L-glucose, where some of the atoms are arranged in a mirror image compared to how they are in D-glucose, and that tiny tweak is enough to render it completely useless to our bodies as a source of energy. D-glucose tastes sweet, but it has no calories, and it would work as an artificial sweetener if it wasn't so expensive to make. Fructose is also known as fruit sugar because it is so common in fruits, But it's also in like sweet corn, sweet potato, carrots, tomatoes. I suppose I already said fruits and tomatoes are fruits. So that was redundant. When fructose is crystallized in its pure form or when it links up with glucose to form crystallized table sugar, sucrose, fructose is usually in a ring form called beta d fructopyranose. But when dissolved, as fructose is inside like the juice of a fruit or in honey, fructose becomes a bunch of different isomers, some of which are laid out in lines rather than rings. There's beta d fructofuranose and alpha d fructofuranose and alpha d fructopyranose and keto d fructose. These are all just slightly different spatial organizations of the same stuff, and I list them only to communicate how complex all of this is. Because fructose is more likely to occur in an open chain rather than in a ring, it actually browns faster. You'll get more of a Maillard reaction with fructose rather than with other sugars. Maillard reaction is what happens between sugars and proteins at high temperatures, and it gets you a golden crust on bread, among other things. 
Fructose also tastes more than twice as sweet as glucose, which is one of the reasons why they make high fructose corn syrup. The sweetness of fructose goes away faster in your mouth, but when it first hits you, it's more intense, and it has a synergistic effect that enhances the sweetness of other sugars around it. When you chemically alter your syrup to have extra fructose, you get more sweetness out of less stuff. Therefore, it's cheaper, and theoretically at least, it's fewer calories per unit of sweetness experience, or whatever they call that. Fructose is also more water-soluble than glucose, which is one reason they generally use high-fructose corn syrup in drinks rather than in candies. Fructose has a softening effect in candies because it holds on to water. You know what else has a softening effect? Whatever the heck they put into MeUndies, sponsor of this episode. Actually, I know exactly what they put into MeUndies because they are super transparent about their sustainably sourced materials on their website. For example, their micromodal undies are made with a fiber derived from beechwood trees. I'm wearing MeUndies right now. All of their underwear is uncannily soft and breathable and cool to the touch, and it tends to stay where you want it to stay instead of creeping up into places where really no foreign material belongs. Plus, MeUndies come in uh, boxer briefs or trunks. I usually, I, wish, I usually wear trunks. Or you can get uh, good old normal briefs or jock straps or long johns or thongs. And I'm still only talking about the dude stuff right now. For ladies, you got your bikinis and boy shorts and cheeky briefs and high-waisted and bralettes, and I haven't even started talking about the patterns yet. The main reason I wear MeUndies is they are so dramatically more comfortable than other underwear, but they are whimsical too. Or they can be whimsical. You can get plain solid colors and such, but you can also get completely insane prints and patterns, dinosaurs, whales, potted plants, space aliens, you name it. Get your own super comfy undies with 25% off your first purchase, plus free standard shipping and free returns when you go to MeUndies.com slash Ragusea. Once you try your super soft MeUndies underwear or socks or loungewear, you'll never go back. Choose from a range of limited edition prints and colors in sizes from extra small to 4XL. You can also sign up for their MeUndies membership, where you get a monthly subscription that sends new styles right to your door. Plus, enjoy up to 30% off virtually everything that they make. Free shipping and returns on every single order. There's also early access to new launches and exclusive members-only sales. To get 20% off your first order, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash Ragusea. That's MeUndies.com slash Ragusea. Thank you, MeUndies. Anyway, fructose. Fruit sugar. It has a softening effect on food, which is fine in a softer candy. There are chocolate products made for diabetics that are sweetened with fructose because fructose does not acutely raise your blood sugar for reasons we will get to. Fructose also lowers the freezing point of solutions more so than other sugars, so it has the effect of softening frozen desserts and such. This may be why fruits evolved to store their energy as fructose more so than glucose. If a berry is full of fructose, it's less likely to freeze during a spring cold snap. If the berry freezes, ice crystals rupture the cell walls, and it is toast. So, fructose over glucose, because fructose lowers the freezing point more so than glucose. Fructose starts off as glucose, though. Plants make glucose via the magic of photosynthesis, on which most life on Earth is based. The plant sucks up hydrogen and oxygen from the ground in the form of water, and it sucks up carbon in the form of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It uses the energy from sunlight to smash it all together into glucose. There's some extra oxygen left over at the end, which the plants are kind enough to release into the environment so that we have something to breathe. The glucose is a little chemical battery. The plant then converts some of that glucose into fructose, 
for some of the reasons we've already mentioned, and some of that fructose might join up with glucose to create sucrose, a disaccharide. It's one glucose stuck to one fructose. And if you eat sucrose, it breaks down readily into glucose and fructose in your digestive system. Glucose is absorbed directly from your small intestine and into your bloodstream where your cells can suck it up with the help of insulin and they can burn it directly for energy. Fructose is also absorbed from the intestine and into the bloodstream, but its absorption is much more complicated and more things can go wrong. I quote now from a 2007 paper out of University of Iowa, the ability of the normal human small intestine to absorb fructose, evaluation by breath testing. I don't entirely know what the following quote means, but I am reading it anyway to try to communicate the complexity of this stuff. Quote, fructose is mostly absorbed in the small intestine through GLUT5 transporter mediated facilitative diffusion. This is an energy independent process and consequently its absorptive capacity is carrier limited. Glucose promotes intestinal fructose absorption by solvent drag and passive diffusion. End quote. The important part there is that glucose facilitates the absorption of fructose. So when you eat a food that has more fructose than glucose, you might have trouble absorbing all of the fructose. And if you don't absorb all the fructose, it'll pass into your large intestine where your gut bacteria will eat it and maybe produce gas and other delights. Some people absorb fructose better than other people do. According to some studies, as many as 40% of, uh, of Westerners, at least, are fructose malabsorbers. For whatever reason, probably genetic, they have particular issues absorbing fructose. And that's why high fructose corn syrup seems to give some people digestive issues and other health problems that are not caused by table sugar. Remember that in table sugar, glucose and fructose are present in equal amounts, and the glucose can facilitate the absorption of all of the fructose. When you eat something that has a lot more fructose than glucose, the excess fructose is known as exactly that, excess free fructose, and it might cause health problems in some people. One example that we've talked about in a video a while back is childhood asthma. There's reason to think that unabsorbed fructose reacts with other stuff in the guts of certain kids to provoke an immune response that ultimately results in an asthma attack. This property is not unique to high fructose corn syrup. Any food that has excess free fructose, i.e. more fructose than glucose, any food that has that could do this to you, but there's simply far more fructose in a can of Coke than there is in a carrot. So the soda is probably more likely to give you problems. Point is, when someone gives you the common sense, conventional wisdom that sugar is sugar, it's all the same stuff, they are wrong. Common sense is great, but science is better. And science frequently proves that the things common sense would predict are simply wrong. The other thing that's different about fructose is that most of your cells cannot burn it directly for energy. Assuming all goes well in your gut, the fructose absorbs into your bloodstream and then it goes to your liver, which can use it directly for fuel. Your liver will burn some fructose for fuel. It will convert some fructose into glucose for use by your other organs and tissues. And some fructose, your liver will convert into lactic acid and glycogen and triglycerides, fats. Fructose is involved in fatty acid synthesis in the liver. All of this explains why an extremely high fructose diet might have some negative health effects that are distinct from a high glucose diet. Tons of fructose might cause some liver disease, for example. This is an area of scientific debate. 
Fructose and glucose are the most common monosaccharides in the plant world. But the third most common monosaccharide is galactose, milk sugar, which is generally synthesized in the mammary glands of animals. Again, it's got the same chemical formula as glucose and fructose. The atoms are just arranged differently. And again, there are several different forms of galactose. Galactose is about as sweet as glucose, which is to say it's not that sweet compared to fructose or disaccharides containing fructose. Yeast cannot ferment galactose, but some bacteria can, which is why we have cheese and yogurt and such. Nobody knows exactly why mammals like us evolved to go through all the trouble of making this different kind of sugar, but it might have to do with our gigantic brains. Galactose is part of the glycoproteins that comprise much of our nervous tissue. So galactose, fructose, and glucose. Those three are the most common monosaccharides in food. Then come the big three disaccharides, which is sucrose, lactose, and maltose. Sucrose is glucose plus fructose. Lactose is galactose plus glucose. And maltose is just glucose plus glucose. Maltose is produced by malting or sprouting seeds out of starch. Plants make gigantic polymers or chains of glucose. Hundreds or thousands of glucose units all bonded together. This is how plants store sugar for later. Microorganisms have a harder time eating starch than they do sugar, so sugar is like small denomination currency. It's more useful to thieves because they can easily go and spend your five or ten dollar bills without getting caught. But if you keep your money in large denomination bills, thieves are going to have a harder time spending those without getting caught. Starch is the large denomination bill of the plant world. And starch is an example of a carbohydrate that isn't sugar. It's made of sugar, but no one calls it sugar, probably because it's too big to bond with our sweetness receptors. We can digest it. We have enzymes that break it right down into glucose, so it affects us just like glucose. But on the way in, we cannot taste starch as sweet, so no one calls it a sugar. Starch is the storage carbohydrate in plants. Glycogen is the storage carbohydrate in animals, like us. Then there are the structural carbohydrates, which are carbs that plants and animals use as like building materials rather than fuel. In plants, the big one is cellulose, which is the most abundant biological substance on Earth. It's simply glucose in a giant chain, just like starch, but it's a lot more glucose, and it's arranged in a different configuration. When starch is broken down by the enzyme beta amylase, as it is inside plants, it doesn't break down into individual glucose molecules. It breaks down into pairs of glucose. We call that maltose. That's what happens inside a kernel of barley when we malt it or put it into the warm, wet conditions where it will start sprouting into a baby barley plant from which we can make delicious beer and whiskey and malted milk and lots of other things for which I basically live. The storage carb, starch, starts to break down into bonded pairs of glucose, and that's maltose. Maltose is the second least sweet of the common sugars. Lactose is the least sweet. It's like 15% the sweetness of table sugar. Maltose is like 40% the sweetness of table sugar. We have several enzymes in our bodies that can break maltose right down into two glucose molecules, and we absorb those and use them for energy, no problem. So after all that explanation, I'm going to offer the following culinary slash nutritional definition of sugar based upon how I observe people actually using the word. Sugar is a carbohydrate simple enough 
that it bonds with human sweetness receptors and is digestible. If it's indigestible, if it just passes straight down to your lower intestine, then it ain't sugar. It's a sweetener. All sugars are sweeteners, as far as I can tell. I can't find any accounts of sugars that humans cannot taste. All sugars are sweeteners, but not all sweeteners are sugars. Just as all job seekers on Indeed have resumes, but not all of their resumes are right for your job opportunity. Indeed is a sponsor of today's episode, and it is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. According to Indeed's U.S. data, more than 80% of Indeed employers find quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment you sponsor a job posting. And as soon as you see them, you can invite them to apply through Indeed. Especially in today's tight labor market, you might find you need to sweeten your posting a little in order to catch the worker bees that you need. So be aware that candidates you invite to apply through Indeed Instant Match, they are three times more likely to apply to your job as compared to candidates who only find your job in search. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Instant Match is just one of Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools. There's also Indeed Assessments, which you can use to really check the skills of your candidates. And there's Virtual Interviews, which are exactly what they sound like, a huge time saver. Don't waste your time looking for candidates across a million different job boards. Join over 3 million businesses worldwide using Indeed to hire great talent fast. You only pay for quality applications that meet your criteria. Visit Indeed.com slash Ragusea to start hiring now. Indeed.com slash Ragusea. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Anyway, all sugars are sweeteners, but not all sweeteners are sugars. Nor are all non-sugar sweeteners artificial. Lots of indigestible, non-caloric sweeteners do occur in nature in small amounts. Nor are all sugars natural. As we just discussed, there are particular forms of glucose that only occur in the laboratory, as far as anyone knows. Of course, sometimes when people describe sugars as being natural, they mean something quite different. They don't just mean, hey, this particular kind of molecule occurs in the natural world. What they really mean is, hey, all of the sugar in this food grew inside this food. Nobody injected extra fructose into this apple. The only sugar in this apple is what the apple tree deposited in there. I mean, we totally bred this apple to grow way more sugar than it would have otherwise, but it's still natural, okay? Is that a difference that matters? I mean, the molecule is the molecule, whether it grew inside the food or whether it was deposited there by a chef who tossed some sugar into the apple slices before baking them or whatever. A banana will typically contain about 14 grams of sugar. It starts off as starch when the banana is totally underripe and hard and not sweet. As the banana ripens, the starch breaks down into sucrose. And as the banana gets really ripe, the sucrose breaks down into individual glucose and fructose molecules. So you're eating about seven grams of fructose and seven grams of glucose. Does that quote unquote natural sugar affect you any differently than say a cup of banana flavored pudding with seven grams each of glucose and fructose in it? The latter would be considered added sugar, also known among scientists as free sugar. You'd think there'd be no difference. Seven grams of glucose is seven grams of glucose, no matter how you get it. But there may be some difference, according to a first-of-its-kind observational study of 110,000 Brits that came out in... Uh, 
February. It's called Associations Between Types and Sources of Dietary Carbohydrates and Cardiovascular Disease Risk, a prospective cohort study of UK biobank participants. Remember that such studies are inherently kind of sloppy because they rely upon people being honest and remembering accurately when they fill out a questionnaire or otherwise answer questions about their diet. This is as opposed to a far more expensive and therefore much smaller experimental study where you actually control what people eat and then document the results. But anyway, these scientists at Oxford analyzed all of this data about what people say they eat and whether they had a heart attack or a stroke or some such. And they found, not surprisingly, that people who eat a diet high in added sugar are more likely to have a heart attack or a stroke or some such. Stop the presses. Obviously, we've known that forever, or at least we've known it since the late 20th century when the sugar industry could no longer buy enough science to conceal the clear positive association between a high sugar diet and cardiovascular disease. But what these Oxford researchers wanted to know is how do these health outcomes compare to those of people who ate just as much sugar, but only natural sugar, which in this context means sugars that occur as part of the whole foods that we basically take straight from the ground and then eat. In practice, that mostly means sugar inside fruits and vegetables and grains and dairy, though meat and uh, fungal foods like mushrooms can also have small amounts of sugar inside them, naturally, or other carbohydrates. This study looked at all digestible carbs, not just Sugar, though the focus has been on sugar. Imagine two people who eat the same exact amount of sugar, but one of them gets lots of their sugar from cakes and soda, added sugar, while the other person gets all of their sugar from carrots and bananas and milk, normal milk, not chocolate milk with, you know, corn syrup added. Which of those two people is more likely to have a heart attack or a stroke? We can't know for sure because the latter person doesn't actually exist. Or if they do exist, they are very, very rare indeed. You would have to eat so many bananas or whatever to get the same amount of sugar over your lifetime as your typical modern Westerner gets in their diet that includes a ton of added sugars in the form of baked goods and candy and soda. Some people really do eat almost nothing but apples and bananas and other whole foods, but they almost certainly end up eating fewer total sugars over the course of their lifetime compared to somebody who eats stuff with added sugar. So these Oxford researchers created statistical models to try to guesstimate what would happen if a person ate that much sugar only from whole foods. And they did lots of other fancy statistical magic, and their conclusion is that, quote, total carbohydrate intake was not associated with CVD outcomes. CVD stands for cardiovascular disease. But free sugar intake, added sugar intake, was positively associated with cardiovascular disease. And positive in this case is, of course, a, a negative More added sugar equals more cardiovascular disease. That's what a positive correlation is. This study only correlated added sugar and other added carbohydrates with heart attacks and strokes and such. The authors do not claim to know why, but they offer a couple of potential explanations. The first one is obvious. Anybody eating that much sugar from fruits and vegetables is also going to end up eating a huge amount of fiber and other nutrients that are protective against cardiovascular disease and all kinds of other bad things. Dietitians will often say it's not the sugar, it's what the sugar comes wrapped in. Like, let's assume for the sake of conversation that you are, like me, a person who just eats too many calories, period. And in that context, we will call fructose a junk food. Fructose inside a tomato is junk 
wrapped in vitamins and fiber and antioxidants and other great stuff. Fructose in a candy bar is junk wrapped in more junk. And fructose inside Coca-Cola is an aqueous solution of junk. It's junk in water plus a stimulant, caffeine. Another possibility these researchers raise is that the particular mixture of sugar types might tend to be different in a diet of added sugar versus a diet of foods naturally containing sugar. The particular balance of glucose versus fructose versus galactose versus sucrose versus lactose versus maltose. And which exact forms or isomers of those you're getting, which rare sugars you're also getting beyond the big six, etc. It's reasonable to suspect that a high sugar diet of whole foods might get you a different balance of sugars than a normal modern diet with lots of added sugars. But that would be a lot harder to study because you'd need really detailed information about what people are eating. I saw a lot of typically bad science reporting in how mainstream news organizations reported on these findings out of Oxford. The headlines basically said, added sugars are worse for you. And that's not quite what this study found. These findings still allow for the possibility that it's not the sugar itself, it's what we eat with the sugar or what we don't eat with the sugar. Then again, maybe added sugars are worse for you is a good enough takeaway for most people. I mean, what's the worst way that could be interpreted? Is somebody going to think to themselves, oh man, I can eat as much sugar as I want as long as it's in bananas and carrots. I'm going to go gorge myself on bananas and carrots. Hey, go ahead. I don't know if anyone has ever made themselves metabolically unhealthy by eating as much fresh fruit as they want with no other concentrated sources of sugar. It's simply too hard to eat that much sugar from fresh fruit. It comes wrapped in too much fiber and water. You're going to fill up faster. Your digestion is going to be slowed down, and that's going to keep your blood sugar from spiking real bad, and that's going to protect you from insulin resistance, and it's going to manage your hunger. Plus, grapes and oranges or whatever are expensive and squishy, and they go bad fast, so you're unlikely to be surrounded by delicious, available, fresh fruit at all times, the way that you're surrounded by delicious and cheap and shelf-stable candy bars at all times. So sure, eat all the bananas you want. See how much damage you can really do to yourself. It probably won't be much. You know the, um, the diet program called Weight Watchers? Hashtag not an ad. Weight Watchers assigns a point value to all foods and something like a candy bar would have a very high point value. Calories basically equal points. You track the points of everything you eat in order to stay on your point target for your goals. Well, in 2010, Weight Watchers changed their system so that all fresh fruits and non-starchy vegetables have zero points in their system. Even though fruits especially are just full of sugars and calories, the Weight Watchers people simply said, hey, we've looked at the research and it sure seems like in practice, fresh fruits do nothing bad to people. This as far as like metabolic health is concerned. They only help. So consider all those bananas to be freebies. Eat as many as you want. It won't affect your points. And then in more recent years, Weight Watchers has added some like lean protein sources and other foods to their zero point list for the same basic reasons. I have no idea if this approach actually helps people compared to just counting calories. There are lots of studies on the efficacy of Weight Watchers and other big commercial diet programs. Basically, they're all pretty effective in the short term and slightly effective in the long term, but I can find no study comparing the efficacy of Weight Watchers before and after they started assigning zero points to fresh fruits. 
that's a pretty tall order for a piece of research. But their new approach makes a lot of sense to me. A person who is conversant in nutritional science but has no actual degrees or certifications in the field. I probably should have told you that about me at the beginning of this episode, but most of you already know who I am. Those of you listening for the first time, wow, I can't believe you listened until the end. Thank you. I intend for this episode to be the first of a two-parter on sweeteners. Next time, we will talk in detail about alternative sweeteners or sugar substitutes, your low-calorie sweeteners like sugar alcohols, allulose, aspartame, monk fruit, stevia. Stevia has been in the news lately because a study came out implicating uh, erythritol in some bad cardiovascular outcomes. Stevia is not erythritol, but it is often combined with erythritol to make a granulated sugar-like product for direct use by consumers. There's tons of great sugar substitutes, but you have to combine them in like weird cocktails if you want them to mimic the behavior of table sugar in the home kitchen. We'll talk about all of that next time. In the meantime... Don't freak out about any approved sugar substitute. They're probably all mostly basically fine for you, as opposed to sugar of lead, which is an ancient artificial sweetener that is exactly as bad as it sounds. Add sugar of lead to the list of reasons why Rome fell. I know I said I'd get back to listener questions this episode, and I did. I have 10 million questions in my inbox about natural sugar versus added sugar versus artificial sugar, and I thought I could answer them all in one episode, but it's going to be two episodes. If you have anything else you want me to talk about, let me know at askadamquestions at gmail.com. Ideally, attach an audio or a video file of you asking your thing. Thanks for listening. Do another one of my things. Make good choices. I'll talk to you next time.